In October 1984, the Conservative Party were in Brighton for their annual conference. At 3 a.m. on the final day, the Prime Minister was still up, revising her big speech. I saw the service private secretary came and said, I haven't um, disturbed you because I know you're busy, but I must have a decision on this. It was something to do with the International Festival at Liverpool. She was reading the minute, and I was sitting there not doing anything except thinking how nice it would be to be in bed in about uh, five minutes' time. And I looked at the papers uh, very quickly and decided, and just as I handed them back to him, there was this loud blast. Before I could restrain her, she said, I must see if Dennis is all right. She opened the door to the bedroom, and she plunged into the darkness through which one could hear the sounds of falling masonry and uh, water, which was, of course, the bathroom collapsing, as we afterwards discovered. And I was left in the doorway wondering how I was going to explain to the Tribunal of Inquiry that I'd let the Prime Minister go into this uh, maelstrom, perhaps never to be seen again. A three-tier slice of the Grand Hotel above the Prime Minister's first floor suite had gone. The air was full of cement, cement and dust, you know, it was gritting your teeth. But I have remained forever grateful that the lights were on on our floor and as we went down. Ambulances arrived as a cloud of dust shrouding the hotel lifted. Early casualties, some on stretchers, some walking, were helped out from ground level. It was not yet clear that lives had been lost. Very well, thank you very much. Our worry is uh, whether there's anyone under that rubble, because I don't know whether you've seen it, but it's pretty awful. Uh, you hear about these atrocities, these bombs. You don't expect them to happen to you. But life must go on, as usual. And your conference thank will you go on. on. Thank the conference you. will go on. The conference, all right, all right, John, the yes. conference will go on. As usual. I couldn't believe it. I said to her, you're not reckoning to continue with the conference when you've got uh, your colleagues, some dead, some still being dug out, dug out of the wreckage. And she said immediately, we cannot let terrorism obstruct democracy. It's what those people would want. We must start on time. It was a very British reaction. We were British. That's what it was. It was an attempt not only to disrupt and terminate our conference, it was an attempt to cripple Her Majesty's democratically elected government. And the fact that we are gathered here now, shocked, but composed and determined, is a sign not only that this attack has failed, but that all attempts to destroy democracy by terrorism will fail. But Mrs. Thatcher's determination was matched by that of the IRA to drive the British out of Northern Ireland. Many young people decided that, uh, that they would join uh, a military force to attack the, the forces of the state. Now, people made those decisions. I, I myself was part of the resistance and uh, part of the struggle. I was very proud uh, to be part of that. Martin McGuinness was already a leader of the Derry Brigade of the IRA when in 1972 British troops killed 14 Catholic demonstrators on Bloody Sunday. Seven years later, and after almost 2,000 deaths on all sides, attitudes had only hardened. Stand still, and I will move. All right. Mrs. Thatcher, the nuclear block. We want this block wiped out. We want our boys and our girls out of this block. We want the freedom for our country and your soldiers out. Mrs. Thatcher became the IRA's prime target in her second year in office, when she faced a will as strong as her own. We are prepared to die to prove that we are special prisoners. In 1981, in this prison in Northern Ireland, 
10 men began fasts unto death. Spearheaded by 27-year-old IRA volunteer Bobby Sands, the hunger strike set out to win for Republican inmates the status of prisoners of war. But it achieved far more. It opened the road to the end game in Northern Ireland. The story began when a local MP suffered a heart attack. When Frank McGuire, who was the MP for Manus South Throne, died, a number of people had the idea that a prisoner should contest the uh, election. A big concern, I think, for many of us was the prospect that uh, a hunger striker would stand in the election and, and, and not won, not be elected and that that could be then used by the British government uh, around the world as portraying that little support for republicanism or for the hunger strikers or, or their plight. I think that Since the troubles the began, week, Republicans had put all their efforts into the armed struggle. Now the IRA's political wing, Sinn Féin, called a meeting to weigh the risks of running a candidate. There were differences of opinion about whether we should try and get a clear field or whether Bobby should be, uh, as it turned out, it was Bobby, but whether a prisoner should be asked to stand anyway. When this was put uh, to the delegates, uh, they were very critical and they opposed it and they turned it down. I got a call from Jerry Adams, I think around quarter to 12 that night of the, the meeting, telling me that uh, it wasn't passed, that they didn't agree to run Bobby Sands. They were afraid that if a prisoner stood and lost, then it would have a, a big effect. I said, Jerry, that's madness. Bobby has to run. Morrison, Sinn Féin's director of publicity, jumped at the chance to win attention for the hunger strike. Everyone looked to see whether the IRA would back it. I said to Jerry Adams that I thought that this was a, a risk uh, worth taking. The, repercussions of, of a hunger striker winning uh, a seat, uh, being the Member of Parliament for Fermanagh South Throne, in terms of the international focus that it would give to the hunger strike itself. All of that was absolutely huge. The Sinn Féin leaders now knew what they wanted. Another convention was arranged, and uh, on more mature consideration, it was carried. We were going to stand a prisoner, and we were going to stand Bobby Sands. Jerry Adams and his colleagues visited the other Catholic candidates and persuaded them to withdraw. The field was clear for Bobby Sands. We will first... Opposing Sands was the Ulster Unionist Party, led by James Molyneux, which wanted Northern Ireland to remain within the United Kingdom. It's they who profess to believe in civil rights the Ulster Unionists, the leading party of the Protestant majority, had always dominated Northern Ireland politics. My name is Harry Wynn. They were the only party to put up a candidate against Bobby Sands. When he was nominated for the election, I was highly delighted. I thought he wouldn't die. I, I thought that Mrs. Thatcher couldn't let him die. The election was too close for pollsters to call. Would Catholics who opposed violence vote for an IRA man? We were waiting the result, and everyone was so anxious that <laughs> it was like a, a pressure cooker. They, they, everyone was perspiring and so on, and all this human pressure and stress all within these four walls. Sands, Bobby, anti-H block, Armagh, political prisoner. There's footage of someone uh, cheering wildly when the announcement of, of Bobby's victory was, in a, was made. 30,000. Yeah! And that was me shouting. 92. Sinn Féin were convinced that Mrs Thatcher would never let an MP starve to death. On Bobby Stan's behalf, I would like to claim victory. Boer Dona Frizzini, Sna H blocks, this is Brison Ard Walker. Victory to the prisoners in the H blocks and in Armagh jail. 
I, I think now that when he sees that the people are behind him, he must go on until Maggie Thatcher gives in. There can be no question of political status for someone who is serving a sentence for crime. Crime is crime is crime. It is not political, it is crime. Get on TV! Get on TV! While Sands grew weaker by the day, his supporters demonstrated their strength in Belfast city centre. Almost two months into his hunger strike, the new member of parliament was close to death. He said that he would um, always love us and pray for us. And we left him, he was quite alert. So um, the next day we went in expecting him to be sitting up, um, ready to talk. When we walked in, he was in a coma. The ritual banging of dustbin lids spread the news of Sand's death throughout the Catholic sectors of Belfast. News crews came from all over the world to cover Bobby Sand's funeral. And the next time I saw him was in his coffin when uh, he was just faded away, just, his hair had been shaved and uh, he looked like somebody from Belson. <clears throat> May God shine on you, Bobby Sands, for the courage you have shown. May your glory and your fame be widely known. It would seem that dead hunger strikers who have extinguished their own lives are of more use to the provisional IRA than living members. Such is their cold, calculated cynicism. Nine more hunger strikers were to die that summer. Look at the wakes. It's not lost on the men. This is what Christ did. He won by dying. So it was very deep thing. Very, very deep. The IRA could recruit all they liked. On the basis of that, you see this element of sacrifice. They were getting worldwide publicity. They were getting a lot of money. They were getting the whole emotions of the Catholic people. The whole voting was turning in their favour. Within one year of the hunger strikes ending, uh, the party was contesting the uh, assembly elections. Uh, Martin McGuinness was the, uh, the Sinn Féin candidate from Derry. I was his election agent. Someone stood up and proposed me. It probably was Mitchell. And, uh, and that was seconded. And uh, I don't think there were any other uh, nominations. Neither the two of us had ever voted in our lives before. On the day of the election, that you know, we had such an amount of workers all over the city, people you know knocking doors and asking people to come out and vote, that I realised then that we could actually do this. And we had arrived, we had arrived big time on, on the political scene. Belfast Falls Road came to a standstill this evening as Sinn Féin supporters celebrated their first electoral success in the city for 20 years. Despite the success, though, the man at the centre of the attention this evening, the former IRA leader, Jerry Adams, says there'll be no change in the provisional's policies. The toll at Bally Kelly, 16 dead, 70 injured. The soldiers thought it was a safe place for an evening out. Many of the 150 soldiers and civilians in the disco were entombed, screaming in the rubble. Within two hours, the rescue teams began pulling out crushed bodies. Republican bombs were not undermining Sinn Féin's success at the ballot box. The main loser was the party of Catholics opposed to violence, 
the SDLP. And in the next general election, voters rejected the former SDLP leader in favor of Gerard Adams. Sinn Féin seemed unstoppable. They had even won two seats in the Irish Parliament. This brought home to the Irish government that Sinn Féin was their problem too. When Sinn Féin organized a huge demonstration in Dublin, the Taoiseach, the Irish Prime Minister, tried to explain his fears in a letter to Mrs Thatcher. We're not as well equipped to deal with that because we hadn't had the experience of dealing with these kind of riots. We didn't have the kind of riot peace preparations they have in the north. I was worried about the consequences. I told her that. It's important from the point of view of security in our state as well as Northern Ireland to get a solution. But it didn't produce any result. Fitzgerald decided he would have to tackle Mrs. Thatcher in person. The Taoiseach's chance came at an Anglo-Irish summit. But the Prime Minister, fresh from her victory in the Falklands War, was more hawkish than ever in defense of British sovereignty. He would have to tread carefully. As soon as they finished posing for the press, Fitzgerald would make his pitch that she needed to do something to win the allegiance of the Catholics in Northern Ireland. Well, I said to Margaret Thatcher, the problem as we saw it was that support had grown substantially for Sinn Féin, representing the IRA after the hunger strikes, was still growing. It looked as if they could come to replace the SDLP as the major nationalist party. And in that event, uh, that could be very destabilising. They might then take a chance on raising the level of violence to civil war level. And for all of us, it was vital that we do something to prevent this happening. Because if you do not provide an alternative, violence will grow. And I cannot foretell, this is the Taoiseach speaking, I cannot foretell what the consequence will be. Every single person in Northern Ireland has the ballot. They do not need and should reject the bullet and the bomb. And anything which seems to help the terrorists seems to me totally and utterly wrong. We're not talking about a normal situation. We're talking about a situation where people are totally alienated from the institutions of government. She roundly rejected the idea of alienation. She never liked the term. She said, I don't like that word. That's a Marxist word. I will not have the word alienation used about my people. I had to say, yeah, well, never mind the word. It's the fact that the system is negative as far as they're concerned, the police, the judiciary, all that. It's not their police, it's their judiciary. And they don't feel part of the system. His idea would be to enable them to identify particularly with the police and the judiciary, so that there could be joint policing and joint courts, for, at any rate, for terrorist offences in the north. I do not believe that anybody could do anything which might be construed as furthering the, the, the objectives of the terrorists. And I feel extremely strongly about it. We've had over 2,500 people, nearly 2,500 people killed by those terrorists. Her view was the Irish should be prepared to cooperate against terrorism anyway. They shouldn't be demanding a price for it. Garrett was saying we aren't demanding a price for cooperating against terrorism, we are trying to help you to engage the loyalty of the Catholic people of Northern Ireland. When the Irish had left, the Prime Minister called her advisers in for a whiskey. Well, we had a fair knockabout. I mean, her way of teasing out a problem was to sort of throw out various outrageous suggestions. I mean, she said, um, you know, the Irish are quite used to movements of population. If the northern population want to be in the south, well, why don't they you know, move over? After all, there was a big movement of uh, population in Ireland, wasn't there? Uh, nobody could think what for. So finally I said, are you talking about Cromwell, Prime Minister? She said, that's right, Cromwell. I knew they were there. She said, couldn't we redraw the border, at least to make it more defensible? She thought, if we had a straight-line border, not one with all those kinks and wiggles in it, um, it would be easier to defend. It wasn't as simple as that, because uh, the nationalist communities were not all in one place, not all in Fermanagh and Tyrone and South Armagh and so on. There were many in Belfast, and the idea of a partition in Belfast or of moving 
large numbers of population didn't seem to be very attractive. And at the end of it, she said to Robert and me, well, you can go on talking, but uh, you've got to make it absolutely clear that joint authority is out, joint sovereignty is not even in question. Only one kind of joint activity was acceptable to the Prime Minister, cooperation on border security, especially south of the border. Mrs Thatcher believed that by having a security zone both sides of the border, or an area where reconnaissance could be conducted, or even hot pursuit into Irish territory, all these would help deal with the problem on the border. The Prime Minister instructed her officials to draw up a proposal. It ignored all Fitzgerald's ideas about joint authority and concentrated on border security. Some weeks later, the British officials presented the proposal to their counterparts in Dublin. I ran up the stairs to tell the Taoiseach. His reaction was immediate and fairly fierce. He said, tell him, go back and tell them immediately that there's no question of a security zone. That's ridiculous. The idea, the whole idea is ridiculous. I mean, you've now two borders the police can't cross. Tell them that's not on. That's going to make it security impossible. It wasn't warmly received, and I was not surprised, really, because it would clearly inv it would have involved the possibility of British troops being involved in action on Republican territory. Too much emphasis on security with no political compensation uh, was just not possible for them. The stalemate was still unresolved when it was time for the next annual summit. When did the fog start in? About five miles from About five miles back towards that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We arrived at in Chequers. It was thick fog, and I think the fog um, entered the discussion to some extent as well. Um, as often happens on these occasions, the Prime Minister went off with the Taoiseach. Once they were alone, the Irish Prime Minister tried to appeal to Mrs Thatcher's own patriotism to help her understand the Irish. I said that she was naturally proud of being British in Northern Ireland. There were a big minority who were proud of being Irish, and... Their identity had to be taken into account. Mrs Thatcher said, why couldn't the minority in the North be satisfied with effective policing, a rule of law? Why did they have to have their own signs and symbols? Those people have got seats on local authorities. They have votes. If they wish to put their view, there are democratic, democratically elected bodies in which to put it. And then she said the Sikhs in Southall didn't want to fly their own flag, and I said, but there's no law preventing them flying their own flag. In Northern Ireland, there is a law preventing nationals flying the flag to which they all gave loyalty. I think you help terrorists when you publicise their cause. And I think what one should be trying to do is to help the law-abiding citizen. They adjourned till the next day and settled down to a good dinner. The next morning began for most of us, I think, rather badly because we had undoubtedly overindulged. Uh, the hospitality had been very generous and there were um, some sore heads around the place and I believe not confined uh, to the Irish delegation. At her dawn meeting with the British delegation, the Prime Minister testily reported that the Taoiseach was still trying to peddle his ideas for joint authority. She really exploded and went on about the Irish and I was, I sat back and thought really, I don't, don't really like this. And I, I withdrew my attention and I obviously withdrew my eyes and her eyes suddenly swiveled round on me and she said, Mr Goodall, so I sat up pretty sharply, she said, wouldn't you like to go and be an ambassador somewhere else a long way away? So I said, coming back to earth, I said, where would you suggest, Prime Minister? And she said, Indonesia perhaps? So I said to Robert afterwards, why did she suggest Indonesia? He said oh, it was the greenest place she could think of. She knew, of course, that he was, uh, had Irish connections, family connections, um, and he came from the Foreign Office, which was never a uh, passport to her closest affections. However, we were then told to prepare a very stiff note, and we emphasised in the note that we were still serious about the business of trying to reach an agreed outcome, but that the whole question of shared decision-making was simply not on. The Irish received the note with their breakfast. 
was, if you like, a sort of missile aimed at the very heart of the Irish negotiating position. And it frankly must have dismayed Irish ministers. Joint authority or arrangements tantamount to or apparently suggestive of joint authority are unacceptable to the United Kingdom government. Certainly sent some shivers down our spines. But the Taoiseach had an ace up his sleeve. The Irish Republic had long laid claim to Northern Ireland. The claim was enshrined in Articles 2 and 3 of the Irish Constitution and appeared to give legitimacy to the IRA's cause. Our proposals did not include any constitutional change, and the more I thought about it, the more I worried whether, if we didn't, weren't prepared to make that change, we'd get anything radical enough on the British side. Something fairly big had to be offered, and the question was what. One of the things that was offered was Articles 2 and 3. So I decided to add that in and to say, that yes, in certain circumstances, if we managed to get a deal that looked like working in Northern Ireland effectively, then we would look at Articles 2 and 3 to show that we were serious. The two sides met in the great parlour. Before the Taoiseach could lay his big concession on the table, the British spelled out the most they were prepared to offer, a security commission. And Margaret Thatcher said then that the role of the security commission, which was to responsible for security in Northern Ireland would of course be purely advisory. And I said that wouldn't do, we'd need to have a, a clear role in regard to appointments and complaints. And she said, that's not on, that's not on, that's joint authority, you can't have that. The word involved uh, got us into trouble. At one point I said to her, you seem to be envisaging arrangements involving the Irish government. And she jumped to me and said, involving? Never used, I never used that word. She hit the roof. Involving, involving, who said involving? I didn't, I never used the word involving. Immediately turned to Robert Armstrong and said, Robert, have you been using that word? Does that appear in any document? If that appeared in a document, I'm in trouble in the House of Commons. Obviously, Robert was in for it there as well. Mrs Thatcher, really from the very beginning, was not prepared to uh, consider anything which suggested any derogation of the sovereignty of the United Kingdom government in Northern Ireland, anything at all. The Taoiseach now played his trump card, his willingness to give up the Irish claim to Northern Ireland. I said to Margaret Thatcher, for that to happen, the agreement had to have considerable substance in terms of security measures, and the role that we would be playing in Northern Ireland. At that time, I think we were thinking of a, a minister in Belfast. The Irish were bidding for a substantial role, but they had overplayed their hand. I had strong reservations which the Prime Minister supported. I just thought the price would turn out to be too high. They could only make this, um, take this step of getting rid of the articles in return for very substantial concessions on our side, far more than we were prepared to make. The British would offer no more than the consultative role they had already proposed. The Taoiseach said, do you expect me to carry that, that I can carry a change in Articles 2 and 3 for consultation, just an impossibility. It will not work. I can tell you here and now, we can forget the whole thing. We frankly doubted whether Gary Fitzgerald's government could get it through the Irish Parliament. We thought it would probably lead to the collapse of his government. And that is why we said, have a look at it again. The whole thing just fell to pieces then. At the end, I wasn't at all happy. And she said I looked depressed. And I said, I was depressed, yes. We, things had gone backwards. We weren't getting very far. And that obviously worried her. And as we left, she, you know, tried to cheer me up. It seemed that the Taoiseach's plans were in tatters. But worse was still to come for the Irish at the Prime Minister's press conference. She was asked whether any of the ideas for giving the Irish Republic a say in running Northern Ireland had been agreed at the summit. I have made it quite clear that a unified Ireland that is out, a confederation of two states, that is out, joint authority, that is out, that is a deal. While the Prime Minister was speaking, the Taoiseach had been in his car trying to listen to her on the radio, but interference prevented him from hearing her. So I went into my press conference totally unaware of what had happened. We had a very extensive and constructive meeting. I think the, the journalists had all come from her press conference. 
They knew, and I was tackled at once about what she'd said. As I didn't know what she'd said, I was in an impossible situation. We understand that Mrs Thatcher, at her press conference, indicated that she was ruling out all the three options. Did she say that to you? We discussed a whole range of possible, possible issues. Um, I was standing at the back of the room and I saw his face drop. It was as if somebody had hit him a blow in the solar plexus. I wasn't at a press conference, so I don't know whether you're quoting her correctly or not in that respect. Um, what was talked about here is, is joint authority. Um, I looked, you know, pretty weak, I think, at that stage. Back home, Fitzgerald's government came under severe attack for this humiliation. There was a period of some, well, weeks, I suppose, in which I wasn't at all sure that it would be possible to go on with the negotiations. Things I want to know what I'm talking about. But Mrs. Thatcher's cabinet secretary persuaded her that they should try to retrieve the negotiations. Over lengthy dinners and even longer discussions, the British and Irish cabinet secretaries drafted compromises throughout 1985, as the two recently reminisced over lunch. I think at that point he was suggesting something like a form of joint administration or joint authority or joint something or other. I remember that was in the, in, in, in the long room in Chequers. Finally, they made the crucial breakthrough. It's a joint Anglo-Irish secretariat would be set up in Belfast but they had trouble finding a name that would be acceptable to Mrs. Thatcher. There were 24 different words, yes. if my memory is right. One of them was committee, another was commission, another was conclave, and then the word conclave. Ooh. There are papal connotations there. In the middle of, when I was in full flight, I still recall this, you said conference. And I said, what? <laughs> and Robert said, conference. Conference is the word, Anglo-Irish Intergovernmental Conference. Stories of an Anglo-Irish deal giving the Republic some kind of joint authority in Northern Ireland began to appear. The leaders of the two main unionist parties came to ask the Prime Minister what was going on. Dr Fitzgerald and I, and indeed the two uh, members of the government, have been talking for some considerable time. Yes, we are making progress. We have not yet reached a conclusion. What she said was, but, but Jim, this is not joint authority. I'm sure you it's not joint authority. And I said, no, but it will lead to joint authority. There are going to be enough loose ends there for them to catch on to, so don't let's fool ourselves with them. She said, surely her commitment to the union was sufficient guarantee to the unionists that she would never give away anything which would jeopardize their interests. He was patiently listening to us and making notes, but giving absolutely no assurances. And that was a signal to me that uh, she wasn't in a position to give assurances of any change because it was all set in concrete already. Two years after the Taoiseach had first tackled Mrs Thatcher, the two prime ministers helicoptered into Hillsborough, just outside Belfast. They came to sign what was now known as the Anglo-Irish Agreement. What the Irish wanted, but did not get, was joint authority in Northern Ireland. But they did get a consultative role in policing through the Anglo-Irish Conference. What the British wanted, and got, was the first ever Irish acceptance of the consent principle that there would never be a united Ireland without the consent of the majority in the North. The whole purpose is to get more stable government in Northern Ireland with a fair deal for each and every citizen in Northern Ireland and to reassure the unionists that their future is all right because the border is accepted, that it could only be changed by a vote of the majority. Mrs. Thatcher had secured the one concession that mattered to the Unionists, but she had not taken them into her confidence and now had to face the consequences. And all I can say, if the British government are determined to reject the ballot box, then they are making the choice of anarchy, not us. And we said that to Mrs. Thatcher, two buttons. Madam, you can press either one, mm. democracy or anarchy. Hey, 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 hey. 
the difficulty for, with the Unionists has always been that uh, they didn't recognize when they were winning. They gained a huge step forward in the Anglo-Irish Agreement and Unionists were winning their basic objective, that only consent could bring change. But Unionist leaders saw only the Irish gains, which had been imposed upon them without consultation. This is not the time for words, it's the time for action. <laughs> Mrs Thatcher doesn't have to live in this country, we do. She's getting sold down the river, that's the start of it. So it's the action now, no more talk, no more marches, that's my point of view. Well I have never threw a stone, never threw a petrol bomb, never threw nothing, but if I have to take up ammunition now, the guns now, I will do it. Believing that their community was under threat, Protestants from all over Northern Ireland headed for Belfast's city centre. To the people here, the Anglo-Irish agreement was sacrilege. This was a rich recruiting ground for loyalist paramilitary groups prepared to fight for their cause. In the crowd of a quarter of a million was a teenager who was to become the most notorious of their leaders. And it was a time where people like myself, who thought, this is it, we're going to be sold down the river. And when we're listening to people like Paisley, who was telling us that this was the case. Where do the terrorists return to? For sanctuary to the Irish Republic. And yet Mrs. Thatcher tells us that that Republic must have some say in our province. We say never, never, never. Very shortly here, it's going to be United Ireland because we listened to this blood and thunder speech that he was making. That we were sold out. That's why so many of us responded to them that came on the streets. Such young men looked for guidance, not to Paisley, but to old hands in the Loyalist movement. I was an active member of the Ulster Freedom Fighters. And in the latter weeks of 1984, I had carried out a, an assassination of a Republican on behalf of the Ulster Freedom Fighters. Stone passed on his skills and experience to a new generation. I travelled throughout Northern Ireland, you know, I was seconded by several brigadiers and the Ulster Freedom Fighters to uh, train these people, to motivate them. Soon, gangs of youths from the Protestant estates threw themselves into the cause. The Anglo-Irish Conference, its name painstakingly chosen to be inoffensive, duly opened its office in a Belfast suburb. But on its very first day, Protestant demonstrators lifted its gates from their hinges and threw bricks and bottles, injuring 38 policemen. The Unionist leaders had called for the protests to be dignified. Was that the kind of dignified protest that you said that you were going to hold today? We had a dignified protest and Lens, we don't want any ignorant remarks for you. You weren't up at the gate. You didn't see the protest. I you didn't see what well you make your own. I wasn't at the gate. I had a dignified protest and if anything happened at the gate, I would have to know exactly what happened. So you tell me what happened. I saw the gates torn down, I saw policemen being hit, I saw missiles being thrown at police officers. Is that the kind of thing you would support? And you didn't, you didn't see a, an assemblyman getting his head cracked. Did you see that? A police officer throwing a baton and cracking his head, did you? Everyone seemed to have forgotten that the purpose of the Anglo-Irish agreement had been to stop Sinn Féin and the IRA. I argued that, uh, that we should keep our nerve that we should stay cool, calm, collected. The IRA could afford to be confident. In the Middle East, a rich and powerful anti-imperialist had embraced their cause. The existence of Britain in the north of Ireland is the uh, existence of colonization. And this we will uh, uh, fight is to uh, get rid of this colonization. It is just a uh, fight and we support it. 
In the mid-1980s, Colonel Gaddafi sent the IRA boatloads of mortars, guns, grenades, Semtex. Some were discovered, but most got through, enough to equip the IRA for a generation. On Remembrance Day, an IRA bomb exploded just before the service at the War Memorial in the County Fermanagh town of Enniskillen. Eleven people were killed, dozens badly injured. People throughout Ireland were outraged. It was a total and absolute disaster. I felt absolutely gutted by it. I felt this would be damaging to our strategy of trying to build uh, Sinn Féin as a political party. She received the news just at the end of our own cenotaph service here and was horrified by the by what had happened, by the way it disregarded everything that was most precious in British life. It's really desecrating the dead and a blot on mankind. I think she felt at that moment the iron really entered her soul. She thought that the time, the political capital she had invested in the Anglo-Irish negotiations was negated by the continuance of terrorism. And she resolved that the whole ceremony in Enniskillen should be restaged and she would be there. That was quite a brave thing to do. After all, given the personal risk she was at, given the personal risk to many others. After the Enniskillen bombing, which was an outrage, which was sacrilege, you know, it uh, was put to me and I willingly took to the task of uh, getting myself down to London Dairy, the Brandywell, i.e. Mr. McGuinness's home to have a look at him for assassination. He was targeted because he was the then head of Nor Northern Command of the IRA. That was in the files I read. So uh, the buck stopped with Mr. McGuinness. So he himself had to be sanctioned, i.e. assassinated. But when Stone came to get him, McGuinness had been tipped off and altered his schedule. Then in Gibraltar, three IRA volunteers were shot dead by the SAS, provoking charges of a new British shoot to kill policy the high-profile IRA funeral that followed gave the would-be assassin a second chance. I knew there'd be funerals. I knew it would now be Milltown Cemetery. I'd been in there over the years. All Loyalist volunteers had been in over there, part of the basic training. Stone arrived loaded down with grenades and handguns. You know, I says, only two people we're after here. And I says, that's McGuinness and Adams. So we'll go for a uh, close quarters, you know, so uh, it was more or less left down, down to me. What we really noticed more than anything about that day was the almost total absence of uh, the British Army. As the Cortez came in and the mourners came in, I'd actually positioned myself on a path on the left of the role of honour, and I planned to shoot McGuinness and Adams, two headshots, as they passed the role of honour. So that was their cenotaph, and that's where they were going to die. But at the critical moment, Stone's view was obstructed by mourners. Once the oration began, I uh, pulled out two grenades, lobbed them over actually the head of the mourners, I 
as I saw him taken off down the, the graveyard, then I uh, I took off after him. But I was a long way behind younger people who themselves had charged after him. And uh, as, as they ran after him, he was firing shots at them and he was throwing uh, hand grenades. They were throwing bricks and I was throwing grenades, so I sort of had the upper hand. And uh, when they were exchanging insults, uh, I actually called Jerry. I says, Jerry, come on. <laughs> These people were IRA supporters, so therefore they were all targets. They were at the IRA people's funerals. And at that time I just felt proud to be a loyalist, that someone like Michael Stone was brave enough to go on and challenge so many people the way he did. The Republican mourners were still pursuing me. Uh, one guy got pretty close. He seemed to know what he was doing. He was ducking in and out behind the uh, headstones and uh, for a second he produced a target and I shot him once and he died. Stone had killed three and injured many more. He was eventually caught by Republican mourners. His head swole up and I can barely look at one eye I could see out of and I went yeah fucking brilliant because I'm lying thinking there yeah brilliant because uh, militarily it was unsuccessful. I didn't achieve the objective. I had actually failed in my mission, so... Soon after, Stone was rescued by the police and put in prison. The SAS had more success against the IRA. In a single operation, they'd killed eight IRA activists in and around this van. The improved security cooperation following the Anglo-Irish agreement was biting. Members of IRA active service units, known as ASUs, were still welcomed at pubs and clubs in Republican West Belfast. When planning an operation against members of the crowd forces, the IRA's first consideration is for the safety of members of the public in the immediate area. Over the past few weeks, RASUs have had to abandon a number of operations against the Crown forces because of... Despite the shows of strength the IRA could still stage, Republican strategists were reaching the conclusion that their guerrilla war against the British could not be won. The bomb was now undermining their success at the ballot box. We had a, a meeting of, of the organisers uh, with, with Jerry and we were talking about political development and uh, the obstacles and of course uh, there was a fairly intense debate. I made it clear that there was no military solution, that there had to be a political solution, that this was not a military problem, that, they, that it was a political problem which required a political solution. How were we ever to prove that politics could work? Uh, unless there was a plan and a coherent strategy. We needed to challenge our political opponents. We needed to challenge and try and work alliances with them and try and isolate areas where we didn't agree but work out cooperation in areas which we did agree. The problem was IRA bombs made Sinn Féin political pariahs, even to fellow Irish nationalists. The SDLP or the Dublin government wouldn't talk to Sinn Féin unless the IRA stopped. So you were in a, was it a catch-22 situation? Um, and the Sinn Féin people could do nothing about creating or developing an alternative unless they could talk to the Irish government and the SDLP. Father Reid had been working for years with Sinn Féin and the IRA he has never before spoken on television about the secret mediation he now undertook. It began when he wrote to the leader of the SDLP, John Hume, with a proposal. The essence of the proposal, the Nationalist parties would agree through dialogue among themselves. This is where we were stuck, because the, 
the other parties wouldn't talk to Sinn Féin. And this letter, actually, these letters were actually designed to try and persuade them to talk to Sinn Féin. Hume had always claimed he would do anything for peace. I got a message from a priest who, who uh, told me that uh, what I was saying was very, was very interesting to Sinn Féin and that they would like to talk to me about it and would I talk to them. Mr Hume didn't know me. He was the leader of the biggest nationalist party. He could have wrote a kind of a polite reply or sent some local person to see us, but he came himself and without any beating about the bush said, OK, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll help. The leader of the SDLP faced a big risk. All respectable politicians said, we don't talk to terrorists. To deal with Sinn Féin meant breaking ranks. Hume believed Sinn Féin should no longer be cold-shouldered but co-opted, and he wasn't ashamed to say so. I'm a politician. Politics is the alternative to war. Politics is about dialogue. I'm about dialogue. I'll talk to anyone about it. That doesn't mean that I approve of what they stand for. The meetings in Father Reed's monastery in Belfast between the SDLP and Sinn Féin, rivals for the Catholic vote, planted the seed that would grow into the peace process. They started with a common goal, a united Ireland, but they were poles apart on how to achieve it. It is very clear from our history that violence had, made, had no role to play in solving our problem. It, it had made no progress of any description in solving our problem. I wasn't persuaded by John uh, that, that, that that was the case. Can you argue that uh, the constitutional and peaceful means has succeeded uh, when the evidence was to the contrary? And I mean, I was, I was there on October the 5th, 1968, the first civil rights march in Derry that was attacked by the RUC. I was there at the Battle of the Bogside when the, uh, the British Army came on the streets. I was there on Bloody Sunday when the British Army uh, shot up a civil rights march and, and murdered 14 people. So those are the, uh, the arguments that we give to the SDLP. And I remember saying, you know, where are you getting? Are you winning this war? Have you any hope of winning this war? You certainly can't continue it, but are you going to win? Or are you going to get to a stage where you're never going to be defeated? Is that your victory? Because if that is your victory, then it's not in the name or in the wishes of the Irish people. They said, well, if the people of Ireland do not support violence. Well, we knew that as well. That was obvious. Go out and ask anybody, do they want a war? And they'll say no. The reality that of what happens on the street, quite clearly, is what dictates individual actions. And, I mean, we invited the SDLP to, uh, to examine the response within our shared constituency to actions by the British Army, such as Bloody Sunday. You know, how many people went out and decided to get involved in the IRA as a result of what the British Army had done on, uh, on that one day? One of the things about the Republicans who use violence uh, is that while we disagreed with them fundamentally, they actually believed in what they were doing. And therefore, if you got the fact that their reasons no longer existed, you had a real chance of getting the violence stopped. Sinn Féin believed that Britain was a colonial power occupying and exploiting Northern Ireland for its own benefit. Here at the monastery, Hume argued that this was no longer true. I, I said very clearly to Sinn Féin and to Gerry Adams and company that uh, the British had declared their neutrality on the future of Ireland in the Anglo-Irish Agreement. I just, how can you say that? The British are not neutral. How would you define British neutrality in Ireland when their army was on the street, when you had emergency legislation, when you had people being killed on, on a weekly basis? Was that neutrality? And, uh, and then he says, OK, well, maybe they're not militarily neutral, but they're politically neutral. And I remember saying what Britain has been seeking for some considerable time was a, a way with honour of getting out of here and shaking the dust of uh, what they would regard as this terrible place off their feet. You know, there was some merit to some of the things they were saying, although this business of the British being neutral uh, was a nonsense. The British will never be neutral towards Ireland. Uh, and by the British, of course, I mean the British government. After eight months, the SDLP and Sinn Féin had failed to find common ground 
and the talks stopped. But it wasn't the end of the story. What was important was that John Hume and I continued to meet afterwards. And uh, we developed, I think, enough trust in each other's, uh, and in each other's just personalities uh, to, to continue that dialogue through some awful incidences. I thought that if they were private, the talks were private, we, would, we could get through them more quickly and, and get, once we got results, uh, we would be publishing the results. John Hume now set out to strengthen his hand with Gerry Adams. He approached the new Secretary of State for Northern Ireland and asked him to announce publicly the change in the British position that the SDLP had tried to explain to Sinn Féin. We did discuss uh, w whether the, the, the way in which Sinn Féin were representing the British position as being a colonial one uh, could in fact be contradicted. The British government no longer had any economic or strategic interest in being in Ireland, and therefore that the, I said to Peter Brook, the British government should say that. The Secretary of State agreed that the time was right for a new declaration. We were seeking to convey that the way in which we were being portrayed in the Republican press as being there for colonial reasons was just fundamentally false. Indeed, the government has made clear on several occasions, notably in signing the Anglo-Irish Agreement, that if in the future a majority of the people of Northern Ireland clearly wish for and formally consent to the establishment of a united Ireland, it would introduce, it would introduce and support in Parliament legislation to give effect to that wish. Which would but it was what he said next that was new, and the television cameras missed it. The British government has no selfish, strategic or economic interest in Northern Ireland. Britain had signalled a new course. And in the same month, the most implacable enemy of the IRA was ousted. Ladies and gentlemen, we're leaving Downing Street for the last time after 11 and a half wonderful years. And in those years, Mrs. Thatcher, despite her natural inclination, had allowed the door to be opened. Now the peace process could really begin.